Good morning, and welcome to University Baptist Church on this Sunday, May 24th, 2020. At any time, you can pause and check out this video's description to see listed there today's worship order, leaders, and musicians. I'll also take this moment to invite each of you to sing along during the Approaching God hymn, the doxology, and our postlude. For our message in music this morning, you'll hear an archival recording of the classic hymn, How Great Thou Art, as performed by Reagan Tackett, soprano, Wylong Tao, tenor, and accompanied by Molly Rausch. Molly's beautiful piano accompaniment provided the perfect platform to showcase Reagan and Will's powerful voices. Will, now Dr. Wylong Tao, was a professional opera tenor who studied at Juilliard, sang throughout Europe, came to OSU for his DMA in voice, and is currently a professor of voice at Shijiang Conservatory of Music in China. I invite you all now to rise in your spirits as Devi, Kay, and Matt chime us in to our time of worship together. Welcome to University Baptist Church. friends. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. At this point in the service, I invite you to greet one another through the Facebook page. You can do that by passing the peace or by posting a word of greeting or just by saying hello. And of course, you can always stop the video for just a moment if you need more time to do it. So at this point in the service, I invite you to greet one another. Um, join us in our call to worship. We make a joyful noise before God who rides upon the clouds. We sing praises to the awe-inspiring God before whom the earth quakes and whose abundant blessings provide for all in need. God is over the earth and in the earth, defender of the defenseless and parent to orphans. God creates families for those who are alone. God leads captives to freedom and breaks the yoke of oppression. God goes before the people, marching through the wilderness of their lives, bringing forth restoration and justice. Sing praise to God, writer and writer of the ancient skies, who dwells in holiness. Proclaim the power of God. O oh God, how awesome you are in, our, in your sanctuary. You give power and strength to your people. Let us worship God. Join me in the prayer. God most high, we gather to honor and glorify you. Dwell with us, enfold us in your spirit. Fill us with holy awe and mystery. Abide in us as we abide in you. Amen. Now join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Good morning. I'm reading from John 17, verses 1 through 11. Jesus prays to be glorified. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that you may Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people, that he might give eternal life to all for those you have given him. Now this is the eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ who has been sent. I have brought you to glory on earth by finding the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. 
You gave them to me and they've obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the word you gave me and they accepted them. I knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one.
17 is perhaps the greatest prayer in the entire Bible. It is also the longest prayer we have from Jesus. John 17 sometimes is called Jesus' high priestly prayer. Now, a priest offers prayer on behalf of others, and in this particular passage of Scripture, Jesus offers prayer first for himself, but then for his 12 disciples, and then he offers prayer for all future believers. So indeed, Jesus is acting as a priest as he offers these prayers. So we imagine that incredible thing that Jesus did for us all those many years ago. 2,000 years ago, long before any of us were born, Jesus was praying for us. He was offering this prayer on our behalf. And my friends, I, I believe that the, the reason that Jesus was praying for us is that he cares for us. In this passage of scripture, this entire John chapter 6, 17 illustrates the wonderful truth that Jesus cares for us. And he cares for us by praying for us. Let's consider the prayer that Jesus offers in John 17. Well, we begin by saying that Jesus does not pray for the things that we might expect him to pray for. Jesus does not pray for our health, wealth, and happiness. Now, these are good things to pray about, of course, and, and we certainly uh, don't want to discourage anyone from, from praying about their, their health and, and how God might lead them to greater happiness. But that is not what Jesus prays about in this passage of Scripture. And Jesus also does not pray that God would would help through times of, of trial and through times of difficulty. Now here too, these are, are, are good things to pray about and important things to pray about, but that is not what Jesus prays about in this passage of Scripture. So even though Jesus doesn't pray about these things, as, as we are going through these times of difficulty, Certainly, we are not discouraged from, from praying about them. Certainly, we pray for help in times of trial, in difficulty. But that's not the focus of Jesus' prayers in this passage of Scripture. Instead, the prayer of Jesus is a very simple prayer. Jesus prays that believers would be one both with his heavenly parent and with each other. Here are these words that we find in verse 11 of our passage of Scripture. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, so that they may, may be one just as we are one. Jesus prays that those, those first disciples, that's the part of the prayer that verse 11 comes from, he prays that those first disciples would be one with God and one with each other. But later on in John 17, Jesus prays specifically for us. He prays that all future believers would be one as well. Notice what Jesus says in verse 23 of our passage of Scripture. He prays that all future disciples, in other words us, would be brought to complete unity. Jesus prays for what we desperately need in this world, unity with God and with each other. But unity is difficult, isn't it? We, we think about the world in which we live, even during this tri time of crisis that, that the entire world is experiencing. We have a hard time having a sense of, 
of unity of purpose in, in moving through these difficult times. Sometimes that disunity comes from, from political leaders as, as for reasons that uh, I can't quite understand, that they, they seek to promote disunity what the, for what they will believe they believe is some kind of political advantage. But whatever the reason, we are have a great deal of difficulty experiencing unity, even during these difficult times. And we think about the church, and even in the church, we have a difficult time coming to a sense of unity. And I suppose that's natural in a way because we come from different backgrounds, we have different habits, and perhaps we, we speak different, different languages in some cases. And so it may be that it's difficult for us to have a sense of unity, a sense of, of coming together. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the, the pastor of the Westminster Chapel for many years, and that is in addition to a worship site, it is a, a, a kind of tourist attraction. And um, so many people from all over the world would come to Westminster Chapel during, during this pastor's time there. And he would engage in conversation with them, of course. And he said it, it always struck him that so many people, when they came, they focused on what was different about their experience of Christianity. Some would say, for example, that they were Baptist or Methodist or Congregational or that they belonged to some other denomination. They didn't focus on what united them as believers as they came to this wonderful Christian chapel, but they focused on what separated them. It seemed to, to Pastor Jones that they set up a barrier that separated them from other believers. Indeed, in our, our world and even in the Christian community, it's difficult to experience unity, to experience oneness with each other. Even within the family of faith, it's difficult to experience unity. Friends, I would offer to you to, that the key to experiencing unity as believers is to focus on the basis of that unity. And for Christians, no matter the human qualities that might separate us, for Christians, the basis of our unity is our faith in Jesus Christ. We have one, one Lord. We have one Savior. And indeed, that is the basis for our unity. Our unity is not geographical, it is not based on language, it is based on our faith in Jesus Christ. We have the same Lord, the same Savior, Jesus the Christ. Sometime back I, I came across this, this a story that was, was told by a pastor about an experience that he had. It seems that he and his, his wife took a missionary trip, and as they, they traveled, they had uh, a, a very wonderful experience, and, and he experienced something that really brought home to him the unity that we have as believers. This trip they took was a a trip to the Philippines where they had been asked to, to go and to, to minister in a, a village school and church. 
And so as they went, they, they saw that it was, this mission school was very remote, it was in a very remote place, and um, there were about 250 students, and there was a sister church that was connected with it. It was isolated. A few outsiders went to that particular community, and it was difficult to access. There were narrow, treacherous dirt roads, and it was situated on a mountain ledge. And as soon as they arrived there, it began to rain, and it just rained torrentially the whole time that they were in that village. And the day, the rain just increased the whole time that they were there. Now, on the day that they arrived, the principal of the school approached this, this pastor and asked him if he, on one particular evening, would, would go up to the, the sister church that was connected with the school and if he would uh, have a, a service. It was the case that there had not been a resident minister in that community for quite some time. Well, of course, he, he readily agreed. But, as I mentioned earlier, the, tra the rain just continues, the in continued the entire time that they were there. And so, on the, the day of the service, the nurse of the school, who was their driver the time they were there, said that they, they just couldn't risk taking the Jeep up to the church because they, if they made it, they would never make it back. And so the pastor would need to uh, just walk up on foot. Well, that is what he did. He went by himself. And so he took a fat flashlight as it was dark. And so he began to make that trip up to the church. Reflecting on it, he says that he will never forget that walk. The heavy rain continued to fall, and he thought to himself at one point after he was completely soaked, what am I do doing here? Why should I have agreed to this evening service? He desperately wanted to turn back, but there was something within a, him that pressed him forward to go on. Finally, he reached the church, and he expected to find there at the church only a, a handful of people. Certainly people would not come out and, and bring children in such a night. But he says he, he could not have been more wrong. The church was filled to capacity. There was standing room only. There was no electricity in that church, so... There were, were candles and Coleman lanterns that provided the light. He said the scene that he experienced was beyond his wildest imagination. There was the glow of candles and kerosene lamps. Every available space was taken. The steady rain on the sheet metal roof, the, pump, the foot pumped organ, leading in hymns of praise, the occasional whimpers from, from children as they worship together, and the beautiful Filipino Christians as they sat and listened to the words of a Galilean Jew as interpreted by an American pastor. Then there, they had asked for a baptismal service, and then as that took place, just the, the amazing way that that happened stayed with this pastor over the years. Here he was as a mission-sent Methodist using the Methodist hymnal, and he was using parts of the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church in a United Church of Christ in the Philippines sanctuary. 
And then he baptized those seven children in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful scene that was, he, he remembers. A congregation rejoicing in the common worship of a common Lord. In that moment, all those folks, no matter what their background, they were all perfectly one. The thing that, that drew them together was the Lordship of Jesus Christ. All the barriers of, of color, of history, of background, and nationality just fell aside because they were one in Jesus Christ. They had come together to worship a common Lord. You know, as we, we think about this unity that we have as Christians... I think about the way the Apostle Paul put it. Paul said that we are in Christ. Our unity as believers is based on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul put this so beautifully in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and following. Listen to what he wrote. But now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far away have been brought near by Jesus the Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made two groups one. He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one, re one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who are near. Through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to be a holy temple in the Lord. So friends, as, as Paul is writing these words, he speaks of those, those two peoples, the, the Gentiles, as the Bible refers to them, and, and Jewish people. And because of Jesus, they, they no longer have to be separate, separated. Now, our divisions these days are much broader than two, but we recognize and, and we believe that as, as Christians, as believers, we can come together and be one people because of Christ. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Jesus calls us to unity. And that unity is based on our relationship with Jesus. Friends, in our passage of Scripture, Jesus prays for us. He shows us that he loves us by praying for us. And what he prays for most of all is that we would be one. We would be united, one with the other, that we would have unity in the Christian community. May we seek that and, and we, may we cherish it as believers in Jesus Christ. Please bow with me for prayer. Oh God, we are so thankful for the privilege of being able to worship together today. And God, we thank you for, for, for Jesus and the, for the unity that he bestows upon us. 
Lord, we pray that you would, would bless us and nourish us and, and help us to grow the unity that you call us to have with one another. In Christ's name, we offer this prayer. Amen. to the time in our service where we have prayers of the people, let's take a second to center ourselves to listen to what the Spirit might have to say to us, and then to offer our hearts to God in this prayer time. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for being a part of this time together. We may be apart from one another physically, but we are never very far from each other's hearts, minds, prayers, thoughts. And we thank you for the fellowship of the saints that we experience here at Un University Baptist Church. And so we come together and we pray. First of all, thanking you that in this day and age, when we may not be able to see the people that we love very often, except in possible FaceTiming or uh, Zoom meetings or whatever they may be, um, at least we're able to see them in those contexts. And we're able to keep in contact with those that we love through this wonderful technology of the internet. But sometimes that's not enough. It's difficult to see our loved ones in hospitals or care centers or um, uh, rehabilitation facilities it's difficult to see them from the window and then only see them on the internet and not be able to take them into our arms and hug them and love them. And it's difficult for many people who, because of the pandemic, have either had to give up their jobs because of being in high risk groups, whether that's because of age or disease or whatever it may be, they've had to say, I can no longer work until this is settled. Financially, that's a very, very difficult thing for many of us. And it's also difficult for those who are still working with ease, what they have termed essential jobs. And they work tirelessly day and night and help to keep us together, whether they're doctors or nurses or whatever they may be, electricians, 
um, whatever their professions may be, if they're deemed essential, they continue working and sometimes feel very, very overworked. And we ask for strength and we ask for comfort and we ask for rest when they're able to rest. And we thank you. We thank you, God, that that rest is in you. That rest comes from you. That rest is authored by you. If we only take it, if we only use it, if we only try to quiet our souls, our minds, and our hearts to rest, not just to rest physically, but just to completely rest in you. And so we thank you for being our rest. We thank you for being our strength, our comfort, our joy. We thank you for being all of this and so much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we have heard music sung and played and maybe even sung along with it. We have read scriptures. We have invoked God, asking God to be present, to speak to us, to strengthen us. We have listened to Pastor Bill uh, share insights from the gospel, and we have prayed. Now we come to the part of the service that's called offertory. The offertory is a time when we stand in, in gratitude before God and offer ourselves again. It's also a time when we give specific things. Uh, we recognize that we are gifted people. Uh, we have resources that God has given to us and we share those resources for the sake of the kingdom of God. I will have a lot of gratitude. Uh, many of you have given generously in this time of economic uh, slowdown. Uh, some of you have, have given what you could, even though you're, were, you were not able to give what you planned to give. And some of you have given more than you planned to give, realizing that others would not be able to give as much as they thought they could. There are, also, there are also other things that we give. Uh, this is a time for us also to reflect on what else we might give to God. Is God asking us to give our time? Uh, what gifts, spiritual gifts within us, is God asking us to share? Uh, is God asking us to serve in special ways? So today is the day that we might decide to give, to give financially, to give of our time, and to give of our spiritual gifts to the world around us. Let us pray. God, gracious and kind, bless all the gifts that you have given us. Comfort in the midst of the threat comrades with whom we share our lives, unconditional love, resources for our needs, spiritual talents, and skills for our, for our sake and for the sake of the world. Give us wisdom as we ponder what we are to give to others. And help us to know how we might give to others with grateful hearts, we now sing the doxology. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above me, heavenly hosts. Creator Christ and Holy. Please hear this benediction. Friends, continue to be faithful. Remain committed. Be witnesses for Christ. For the God of all grace has called you to eternal glory through Jesus Christ and will fulfill, restore, strengthen, and establish you through suffering and struggle. May you be empowered by Christ's love with Christ's name on your lips, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in your mind, God's love in your hearts, God's beloved ones always in your sight, and God's still speaking voice in your ear. Friends, please bow me. Friends, please bow with me for a moment of prayer. Oh God, we thank you for this privilege of worshiping together. And God, we, we pray for renewed strength during these days. And we ask you to dismiss us with your grace and with your peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere. Oh, now.